Rob Mario is not here today. I am joined by Bill Kearns and Matt Miller. Welcome back, guys. And over the phone, we have Phil McCoy. Phil, I wanted to, now that I'm a volleyball dad, um, there you I, need, go. I needed to bring up something that I'm, I'm really mad at you about that you haven't brought up for the last six years. I, I think I might be introducing a bill that increases the size of shorts in my young lady's so. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, uh, th those, those, uh, those shorts are, uh, and they, they've always worn them and, and you, you can buy longer ones. I'll tell you that as a, as a volleyball dad, if, they want longer shorts. You can certainly buy them, and it's not against the rules to wear full full length tights. A lot of kids do that now. So I, I, I bought the longest cool. shorts, but my daughter won't wear them. She's not going to wear them. No, no she, she, she wants to be part of the, the team. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. And the so you can wear the longer tights, which is becoming more and more common, especially in the club world. If you get into the travel world, you'll see that more and more where they're wearing the full length tights. And occasionally you will see some that just wear the mesh shorts. It's not very often. With the amount of amount of practice that she has already as a uh, middle schooler in the freshman high school team, I don't think we're going to be doing any travel. Uh, the, this, the amount of practice she has uh, and the amount of work they put in, I, I'm pretty impressed right now. Well, Mike, do you think yeah, that has it, something to do it, with the aerodynamics? Perfect. Not being able to move around the court that much. <laughs> I, I, I think it's got to do with sliding on the court. It, you know, a lot that's of that was it was explained to me. Yep, it, <laughs> it does have to do with that. So th I think there is a practical reason for those those miniature shorts. Mm. But uh, I still but think you, a, you a bill down in the yeah. legislature making them uh, 13, 14 <laughs> inches would be appropriate. You know, yeah, ban the Daisy Duke shorts, yeah. Bill. <laughs> 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 so, Phil, we're in week one. A football season we're three three days away um yeah. what will you be doing this sunday and uh how do you think your students well, are going to fare let, let's talk about let's let's talk about football in context with volleyball because we'll be going again this sunday to uh tennessee for you, volleyball so and you just got back from hawaii play. correct we just got back from hawaii yesterday my man so and we're headed back out and was that to, the uh, high school team or your travel team because that seems like a, no, that was high school that was high school. The um, so the the high school team I think had planned on uh, Mossman had been working on this for quite some time. And I think COVID got in the way. I'm not quite sure, but there was talk about it years ago when my oldest used to play, and I think COVID got in the way of some of the fundraising. So this was uh, this certainly isn't an every year uh, venture, but it it was it came to pass this year. So that was that was last week. This week will be in Tennessee, but I will have my ear on what the Pittsburgh Steelers <laughs> are doing. But I'm a fan from a distance during volleyball season because of my fatherly duties with volleyball. <laughs> so how did it go in Hawaii? Oh, it went great. You know, they uh, that was real. And, and you would expect if you're going to, uh, we went to the Big Island, you would expect that the competition is going to be insanely good, and it was. And from top to bottom, it didn't matter. You could... You could throw a dart, and it didn't matter. They they were all like, "Oh my goodness, look at these!" You know, some of these teams. They were mainly from, of course, you know, uh, about half from Hawaii, and the remaining from California, Texas, a few from Nevada, and then us. But it was uh, we were by far the furthest away. Uh, but the competition was insane. You don't necessarily go to those tournaments. Of course, you want to win. But you don't necessarily go to those types of tournaments to win. You go for the experience and the team building and 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 the competition. So they finished. I want to say it was two and six overall, but in sets it was eight and ten. So they did. There was a lot of three set matches. Uh, really, really tough competition. Those girls on the west coast and the far west coast in Hawaii. They're 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 talented and, and they're really good. Most and a lot of them were prep schools. So not a lot of uh, public schools there. A lot of uh, prep schools or private schools uh, that attended, but it was good. And then we got some vacation in it. Of course, we went a little bit early and, and did a few things over there. So it was a, a great experience and recovering from it now. But then I head back out this weekend to Tennessee. And, and that's for Musselman too in Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Travel doesn't start, Mike. And and I know you say you're not going to participate, but maybe you will. Maybe your daughter has a different plan. Right. Travel won't start until right at the end of varsity season. And up until recently, and you you were part of this, 
up until recently in West Virginia, high school kids couldn't do any type of travel or any type of I was just club about to ask about activity that. during the season. Uh, but now they, they can. Now, not to say that they will because their high school season is so busy anyway. But club season won't start until early November. Gotcha. So moving on to Steelers' prediction uh, for the season. Well, uh, Rob asked me this morning, and last year, I think they're going to be a better football team this year than they were last year, uh, simply because... Even without a quarterback? Their, well, they still have they have two quarterbacks. <laughs> they have three quarterbacks. But that quarterback room is better than what it was last year. Now, it may not be, of course, you don't have Patty Mahomes or Justin Herbert or one of the, the top-level guys, but the quarterback room is better than what it was last year. And as the season goes on, I think we'll see that the offensive line is much improved from last year. Now, they got a lot of young faces. They got three guys, two first-year players, and then a rookie and, and, and two rookies um, playing and, a, and two second-year players. So four of their five offensive linemen are in year one or two starting the season, but they're all – uh, talented offensive linemen. So as the season goes on, I think that O-line will look better. And, of course, their defense is nasty as always. I'm going to give my Pittsburgh Steelers, with the toughest schedule in the NFL, the same record they had last year, it will be a different narrative this year than it was last year. It was last year, it was like they had a good end of season. They finished 10-7, and seven, but you were still kind of disappointed as far as what Steelers fans would expect. I'm going to say they have the same same record this year slide into the playoffs and maybe maybe cause some damage into the playoffs. I think they're going to be better this year than they were last. Did you use the name Justin Herbert just to, to appease Mike? I did. Yeah, of course. I did a little bit. I did, but he is a good quarterback. <laughs> he I is. Did. How about your Shepard Rams? Phil, what, oh, what's man, your... The, what? the, well, and, and I don't know much about Shepard, quite honestly. I, I know what they've got coming back, and I know what they're expected to do. But the, my, our Shepard Rams are always, always, always strong. There seems to be a little bit, uh, you know, since uh, Bajan has left and done great in the NFL. And Fisher, who was on Pittsburgh's roster there for a little bit, uh, ended up not making the making the 53-man roster. But since those guys have left, there's been a little bit of a letdown. But uh, you know, Rams don't re uh, Rams don't rebuild; they reload. So uh, I, I expect them to uh, compete for the PSAC and be right there for in the playoff hunt and when the season comes to an end. So the reason we usually have you on is obviously to talk, talk about the market. Uh, you said recently, uh, I think I heard a stat that we're 0 and 4 the last uh, four Septembers. Um, we are. The, 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 what do you expect for September um, and what do you expect the Fed to do and what are your thoughts for the upcoming week? And you, and you brought it up, the, the, the main narrative is going to be the Federal Reserve, and there's, there's no guess now about rate cuts. And we got that word from Jerome Powell at Jackson Hole where he didn't say it as definitively, but basically suggested, yes, we're going to begin the rate-cutting process. And, and what does that process mean and what's it look like? And that's what our markets will, uh, uh, will read or try to read into what he says in a lot of the inflation reports and, in particular, job numbers. So we have to remember what the Federal Reserve's job is. We, we blame them for a lot of things, especially now that we'll pick on Rob since he's, he's homesick. But when, whenever the markets fall, we like to blame the Federal Reserve and give them heat about it. But the market isn't the Federal Reserve's mandate. Their mandate is inflation in a healthy job market, and that's, not, that's supposed to be all that they care about. So when we look at inflation and jobs, I'm not saying it is all they care about, but it's supposed to be all that they care about. But when we look at inflation, it has continued to fall. And, you know, John Gilstrap, I don't think he's here today, but John, John Gilstrap would, yeah. would, 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 would remind us all, and he's correct, that just because inflation is falling, that doesn't mean deflation. So if you hear that, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden things are becoming less expensive. It means they're getting more expensive slower. And But they're trying to get that down to uh, 2%, and we it does appear that we're on our way to that. There'll still be sticky points, but we're still on our way to that. The Federal Reserve will make moves in advance of us getting to that 2% target because it takes about six months for any move on the, on, in, the, in the rate world for it to make its way through the economy. So you can't wait until it gets to 2% and, 
and then begin cutting rates because the other side of the mandate is now shown some pressure. We've seen the unemployment rates take up to at last check. 4.3%, and in a vacuum, that 4.3% isn't all that bad if you just look at it in a vacuum. But it was a huge increase based off of the last unemployment number, which I think was 4% or 4.1%. So that's a pretty big jump uh, from month to month. And that spooked us a little bit early in August. If we remember, I think it was August the 5th that we, we started this slide that we ultimately recovered from, but we recovered from it because of the weekly jobless claims. We get that every week, and normally it's a kind of a ho-hum report because it's a weekly report, but we get that every week, and it beat expectations after that, so it kind of eased their fears about a recession. So now we're in this balancing act where we want inflation to continue to come down. We want the Federal Reserve to cut rates, but we need the job market to remain okay. It doesn't have to be strong. A strong labor market was actually part of the problem for the last couple of years with inflation. So we want it to be okay. It doesn't have to be at 3.1 or 3.2% unemployment, but it's gotta be okay. Because on the other side of this inflation battle, we have recession fears. And, if it, and that's what kind of sparked up that fall that we had in early August that we recovered from. But that fall that we had in early August was all because of recession fears. So when it comes to the Federal Reserve, when they make this next announcement, I think what our markets want to see is just confirmation of a quarter of a percent rate cut. If they do half a percent, that may spark a fear that we are on a, on a path to recession and the Federal Reserve fears a re recession. Make no mistake about it. You know, I, I'm kind of tired of talking about drone pound and, and, and the Federal Reserve and rates as well. I mean, we've been talking about it for a long time. But make no mistake, they are the most important thing as it pertains to our markets and maybe even internationally is the Federal Reserve and the path at which they start to cut rates. So what I would expect and what our markets expect is a quarter of a percent rate cut. Now, having said that, you'd ask what we expect for September. I don't really know, but when you look at now until the end of the year, I would expect without any unforeseen uh, market reports that our markets would do fairly well just because of the path. The Federal Reserve, it looks like they're winning, even though Rob wouldn't agree with me, I'm picking on Rob but it looks like they're winning this battle with inflation. And how they win that is with a soft landing or a short-term recession. We've all expected a recession for years because normally that's what follows bringing inflation down. But it looks like they may be able to accomplish a soft landing, which is to say we brought inflation down without going into a recession. And if that happens, our markets will continue to cheer that. And a lot of it's been uh, in, uh, underneath of it all our markets hadn't fallen in the process in 2024 anyway because of artificial intelligence and the hope that that's going to bring some, some type of, uh, of, of gains to mega cap companies and, and really all companies with what it, the, the, the process of which we, we start to change how we buy things and, and the uh, advertising algorithms and all of this is something new that we can sink our teeth into. So, Phil, um, with every, this is Bill, um, with everyone moving into our, or wanting to move into the eastern panhandle, is this the time um, that, as we end, head real quick to the last quarter of the year, is this the time that people may want to look at wanting to invest in real estate before the end of the year? Or would you caution people to kind of hold off a little bit longer? Well, you know, the real estate market is, is a strange one. And now when we look at how real estate pertains to portfolios and retirement accounts, we're not really looking at buying homes and selling homes and, and, and the such, because for the most part, our individual clients, if you sell a home and you take advantage of a increased prices in the real estate market, well, you also have to buy a home. So it's kind of an offset uh, that, that we would occur on the, on as it pertains to our clients. But when you invest in real estate, it's really important to see how much of what, what you've got going on in your portfolio is in real estate and what type of real estate. Is it retail spaces? Is it in tranches that you would purchase with mortgages and, and some that would refinance? And you know, let's go back to 2008, 2009, where that was a big part of portfolios and it really came back to bite us because what people were purchasing were these high rates, those 
those, those, those consumers that really probably shouldn't have qualified for a mortgage, but they were getting them, but they were at higher rates and people were buying tranches of that and getting great returns off of it. And of course that failed us off. But, and that, so that was on the personal side. But as far as real estate is concerned, it's important to see how much is in your portfolio, how, what kind, type of exposure do you have? Is it retail space? Is it long-term care spaces? We used to really dive into that in 2015 through 2020, the long-term care uh, um, uh, facilities and, and the real estate that REITs uh, with that. But with REITs comes a measure of illiquidity. And, and most of the time when you're talking about real estate, you do have a liquidity issue. And, and one thing that we are very uh, partial to here at our office at 1270 Winchester Avenue is liquidity. We want to be able to get in and out of something as quickly as possible. And real estate doesn't always give us the ability to do that. So we're really cautious with how much we go into real estate. Matt? Phil, I want to go back to the unemployment numbers and, and why those numbers are so significant. Is it a matter of the more people working, the more money is going into the economy, whereas the fewer people working, maybe there's a little less? Yes, yes, it is. And, you know, and it was it was difficult to talk about uh, over the last couple of years because we wanted to see some sort of struggle in the real estate market, uh, or not real estate market, but the employment market, because uh, good employment numbers are, while they're good, it's an inflationary pressure. So if you just think of, and, and really break it down to a micro level, and it may not be for us here on the phone or some of our listeners or some on Facebook, but if you have more money coming in the door, it enables you in your household, it enables you to spend more money. And that is human nature, uh, where you spend what you make. So what we've seen over the last couple of years, where people were working and wage inflation, although it didn't, if you look from start to finish, it may not have kept up with the uh, overall inflation, but wage inflation did support inflation because it gave us more money to spend. And, and I talk about this all the time and you know it's not always agreed with but we're, we're still to the point with where well we would go into a, a retail store or a grocery store and we still purchase these things at the much higher cost and we wait we'll walk out complaining about how much we've just spent on something well when you look at that we are the consumer was the number one reason why this inflation took so long for it to start coming down is because we supported it and I don't, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily blame corporations. A lot will blame a corporation. But if we're spending the money on whatever it is that they're selling, I always my wife says, "Why do you use widgets as an example?" I don't know, but a widget is, you know, just just a, 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 an acronym for anything that we may purchase. But if we're willing to spend twenty dollars on this widget, they're going to sell it for twenty dollars, and that's that simple. But strong uh, labor market and strong. Um, wages will support us spending the $20 on a widget. Eventually, if you don't have enough to spend $20 on the widget, you'll refuse to do so. And that is what brings the prices down there, or that is what slows inflation. And so the strong labor market has been a, a headwind for the Federal Reserve to get this. So for so long, when we saw 3.2% unemployment and wage increases, our markets would go down. And then we would say, well, good news is bad news as it pertains to the market because we knew that that was an inflationary pressure. So as in the, the job numbers started to slow down and, w and unemployment numbers started to trickle back up, even though in a vacuum they're in a good spot and they started to trickle back up, that gave us hope that inflation was on its way down. So that's how that, those wages and why it's so difficult for the Federal Reserve. So on one hand, they need to keep inflation down, but on the other hand, keep a healthy labor market. So they knew that the labor market needed to soften some in order to bring inflation down, and that's what we've seen over the last uh, six months or so. I am more of a lobbyist for Spacely's sprockets than for your widgets, if we could talk about that <laughs> afterwards. Uh, so, yeah. Phil, what but you're I saying can, is, like, a, a case of eggs is costing $20. Let's say that case of eggs come down, back down to normal numbers, $12 right, right around there. You're saying that will drive us into a recession, maybe? When, uh, when we have deflation? 
Well, deflation, no, 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 that's not deflation. Okay. And what deflation is is when prices actually come down from their norm. So the inflation slowing. So if you look at, let's use the widget or space rocket or whatever we use. <laughs> Thank if you. It is going, if it's going up in price, at one point it was at 9.1%. Uh, and I think it was 2021. I don't remember the exact time period. But on a yearly basis, things were going up 9% on average. And so you had all these, you got all these little tranches of things that they measure. But on average, this basket of goods that we measure in the CPI report, they were going up 9.1% on average per year. So now that's all the way back down to about 3% in the neighborhood of 3%. But, but that's, that's still on top of the 9%, correct? The 3%? Because yeah, it's comparing yeah. it to last year. It's still going up. Yeah. It's just going up slower. So it's not going <laughs> down. And the strange thing is deflation brings on uh, a huge fear. Deflation is something we, we may think that we want to see, but we do not want to see that. We do not want to see that overall basket of goods. Now, if you look at one thing in particular, say like eggs. You know, eggs was a good example because at one point, uh, eggs went up to about $5 a dozen or maybe even a little bit more, and then it came back down. So the eggs deflated. But when we look at the CPI report, we're not picking out just eggs or just bananas or just cars. We're putting everything together, and you can see that on, on the CPI report, whether it's housing or rents or insurance and autos. Uh, groceries and energy and everything that comes together, there are some of those that deflate. There's a lot of those that deflate. But overall, when you put them all together and average it out, there's not. it's not deflating. Deflation is terrible for the economy, and that's something we do not want to see. We may think we do, but we do not want to see that because along with that comes wage deflation mm -hmm. as well and extremely high unemployment. So I think we need to basically take something from this segment is we need to keep a careful eye on eggs and widgets. <laughs> and space rockets. Yeah. Space space space. I use blueberries all the time as an example. That's something else I get a hard time. Because I always, I always bought my family, you know, I use micro examples, but we used to buy these big, huge bags of frozen blueberries. We all like blueberries, especially me. But they used to they got up they used to be nine ninety nine, then they went to twelve ninety nine. And then they went to fourteen ninety nine. That was my breaking point. That's when I stopped buying the frozen blueberries. And by, I complained at twelve ninety nine. I stopped at fourteen ninety nine. And that was the part of this inflation that we struggled with: is that we would complain about things, but we didn't stop doing them. And it's not until we stopped doing them that those prices subside and inflation starts to come down. Are they back down? Uh, yes, they are, but I moved on to bananas, and I didn't go back to something <laughs> That is the beauty of the free market system, right? Yes, hey, it is. Phil, certainly one thing that will be drawing everyone's attention, not that it hasn't already, but now it begins to ramp up, right? It's September, then there's October, and then Election Day, early November. Uh, talk about the election, and, and especially this major presidential election and the impact that it could have on the market, or does it have much at all? I don't think in the long run, and we do talk long term mostly, in the long we there may be a little jolt, there may be a little shock or surprise in November when whoever wins, wins. But in the long run, it won't have much of an impact on the market. You've said it over history. It doesn't really matter if it's a, a, pre, a president that is Democrat or Republican. I think what the markets like to see is a split Congress. I think they like to see a, a Republican and Democrat a mix with the House and the Senate, quite honestly. But as far as the president is concerned, there, there could be some asset classes or some industries that would perform better under Republican or perform better under a Democrat based off of policy. But when one performs poorly, and I use energy as an example because of where I'm from in the coal field, if, if coal performs poorly or if natural resources perform poorly, then green energy would perform uh, better and vice versa. So the overall market, I don't think, will be impacted much. But what lies inside of your portfolio, that's why people use mutual funds so much, but the, what lies inside of your portfolio uh, could be impacted if you have a strong concentration in one company or the other. People use mutual funds because they rely on the mutual fund managers to pick the right companies or the ones that may be in favor because of politics or who's president or who controls the House and who controls the Senate. So in overall, I don't think it'll have much of an impact. There's a few things 
that policy wise kind of spooked me a, a little bit that could it could be a headwind uh, internationally but but nothing nothing that would cause us to say all of a sudden we need to move out of this and into that or, or so forth we'll rely on portfolio managers and mutual fund managers to make those decisions and have their ear to the ground with that Phil, one minute left. Um, when, when we talk about like green new deals and energy and all of those kind of things, how, how much has that kind of changed the, the market, if you will, as people want to invest maybe in certain things and not in others? Well, it's strange enough, you know, with, with the green energy, you would have thought over the last four years that it would have done better, but it, it hadn't really performed the way that you would thought that it would have. And I think in large part is because part of that Green New Deal, it was an inflationary pressure, whether you agreed with it or not. There's a lot of things you can agree with, but it still be an inflationary pressure. Nobody likes inflation. Uh, but regardless, the, the Green New Deal did bring about uh, more in inflation, which was a pressure against our markets. It caused a part of, and there's a lot of reasons for this inflation. I don't want to really get into arguments about what, but there's a million reasons why everybody that's typing in saying, well, it was this and it was that. It was all of it. You don't have to argue. It was all of it. So many things, but the Green New Deal was part of it. So on one hand, where it could... Phil, how do people get a, get a hold of you? Sorry for cutting you off. We're up against a hard break here. You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue, right here in Martinsburg. Always good to talk to you, Phil. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, guys.